Hello there, Mad Mike here, and welcome back to the channel. Um, and I apologize for not getting to this news yesterday. Uh, something came up and I didn't have a chance to make a video, but I do want to make one on it today, and that is the unfortunate passing of Italian composer Ennio Marconi. And uh, this is kind of, it, it's a little, I, I don't want to say personal, but the I, I honestly very much loved Ennio uh, Marconi's work. He he did a lot of films that I really, really enjoy, and a lot of memorable scores that I don't think I will ever forget, and I don't think moviegoers will ever forget. Um, now, Marconi was 91. Um, reportedly, he, he died due to complications after a fall uh, where he broke his leg last week. Um, so it is unfortunate that it wasn't, you know, just old age taking him away but uh you know he, he was 91 but um i, I want to go into a few pieces of his work that i really really do enjoy and some stuff that he did that i i really think kind of it brought him to a different level and remind and also a reminder he is an oscar winner as well he won an oscar for the uh, soundtrack or for the uh, musical score for the hateful eight which was the uh quentin tarantino movie um so there's a few things that I really do love about him. First of all, he actually has composed music for three of my favorite directors, uh, namely Dario Argento, Sergio Leone, and John Carpenter. Um, and the John Carpenter one I will get to because that is, that is an amazing one. And to be fair, some of the stuff that he's done, too, he has over 500 uh, musical credits to his name for film uh, and television, I believe, as well. Um, and it's just so prolific that he he's been i mean he still has two compositions that i believe are yet to be released they're due to be released um either sometime later this year or early next year so there's still a lot of stuff there but then the other thing is, is that all of those films by sergio leone um he did a total of seven of them but i'm, I'm going to highlight five of them here uh, but before I do that, I'm going to go with some of his earlier stuff, which was stuff he did for Dario Argento. And it's called Argento's Animal Trilogy. Now, it's kind of like just like a, a series of films that have animals or, or creatures in relation to the title. And that's The Bird with the Crystal Plumage, Cat on Nine Tails, and Four Flies on Grey Velvet. Um, the latter of the two, I would say, are probably superior. I do like Bur The Bird with the Crystal Plumage. I think it's a great giallo. Um, but the other two, are, I think, are a little bit more unique. Um, I, I love Cat of Nine Tails as well, and Four, Fly, uh, Four Flies on Grey Velvet. And the thing that Marconi does with all of those scores is he captures kind of that tension and randomness that uh, Argento always sort of had uh, with the way that his movies looked. And I think that that's, that's one of the hardest things to do um, with a movie is to get the music to match the scene. And if you have a really good composer, that always happens. And Ennio Marconi was a great composer, and that's why the music matches those movies. That's why those moments in those movies where you did the music chimes up, it feels very tense. Um, and then, of course, after uh, those three films, then Argento would wind up going to uh, Goblin for a lot of his music, the band Goblin, uh, for Deep Red in 1975, and then several other films after that. Um, but the bigger, I, I think, contribution that Marconi made was to Sergio Leone's films, and that's where a majority of his very memorable songs come from, especially the Dollars trilogy. Now, that theme that they have, To a Fistful of Dollars, is one of the best Western, I think it's actually the best Western theme I've ever heard, out of any Western. It doesn't matter what Western, if you put that, uh, if you put that tune to Fistful of Dollars, you immediately have a visual of Clint Eastwood in that poncho with that hat and that little, you know, mini cigar that he used to always smoke. He has the, the gun on his side and he's kind of looking down at the ground and he spits and that kind of thing. You have that scene in your brain when you hear that music. And that is the ultimate compliment to a composer for a film where all you have to do is hear the music and you're watching the film in your brain. You know, it's kind of like the Jaws theme. And that's the other thing, too, is that even though he was he could be very elaborate in a lot of cases, a lot of his themes were, or at least a lot of his, his uh, horror-related themes, um, were very, very uh, minimalist in some ways, especially stuff for the thing. Um, but sorry, I'll actually I'll get to that in a minute because I actually want to get to uh, a couple other films that he did that I really, really enjoy as well, which, again, were directed by Sergio Leone, which were Once Upon a Time in the West and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Um, and Once Upon a Time, I'm sorry, not Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, that's a Quentin Tarantino film, Once Upon a Time in America, which was a Sergio Leone film. 
um, with Robert De Niro. And I honestly, I love that movie. It's one of my favorite films. It's a travesty of a film because the theatrical release was only an hour and a half long, which I, I, I think is a, is a crime both against Marconi and Leone. Um, because that film, is, I would put on par with The Godfather um, in terms of its 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 entire runtime. I mean, it, it is a very long movie, but um, when it comes to that movie, the 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 tones are just they're so sad because you you're going in between when uh, Robert De Niro's character is younger, when he's you know at first when he's a kid, and then later on when he's you know in his mid twenties, and then we we meet him again when he's a lot older, when he's in I presume his fifties or sixties. And when we do all those kind of sad moments in the present, like look look at what has become of these characters that, that we that we're watching, um, you know, how do they get to this point? And Marconi's music is very melancholy. Um, you know, it 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 makes you feel for the characters, and I think that's the other thing too is that when you have a composer that can complement not only the scenes in the movie but the actors themselves because in a lot of cases the actors will have their own theme when they do you know some musical scores and stuff they'll say okay this is this person's theme and that person's theme um and i don't know specifically which ones would be you know james woods probably had his own theme robert nero probably had his own theme there was probably a theme specifically for when they were both in the same room as each other um in once upon a time in america um you know charles bronson had his own uh uh, theme in Once Upon a Time in the West as well. So, you know, but they're all original. They all match those characters very well because Robert De Niro in that movie is such a sad character. And James Woods in certain ways is as well, even though he doesn't really come in in the in the present timeline. You know, he, he we see him a lot in flashbacks. He's in a very, very large chunk of the movie for the flashbacks. But when they go back to present day, you really don't see him until the end of the film. Um so, but you you kind of get the idea at the end of that movie because it's a very bittersweet ending. On top of that, it's not a happy ending to that film. It's a it's a very very uh, very very sad ending. And again, Marconi's music kind of reflects that in a lot of ways. Where Robert De Niro is just this sad old man in certain ways. He's lost everything in a lot of ways. He's lost all of his friends. Uh, you know, his, his the the pe- the woman that he loved. You know, all all that stuff. He's lost all those people, um, one way or another, through his own actions or through the actions of others. And he, the music reflects that very well. Um, but but now I kind of want to move on because I don't I don't want to dwell too much on certain things. Um, I, I want to go to the thing because the thing I think, as far as a horror theme goes, that is his masterpiece. Because that song, or I shouldn't say that song, but that score in that film, it matches the paranoia that you feel in those moments. And when he goes, dun, 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 it's so minimalist. Again, it reminds me a lot of the Jaws theme, um, but not so much that it feels like a ripoff, because I don't think it is. It, it's very much its own thing. But uh, you know, certain people criticize that when the film came out, and I find that extremely hard to believe. Um, I think people just really wanted to hate that film for whatever reason, critics didn't like it, uh, audiences, uh, horror audiences loved it, um, but general audiences did not like it very much, um, but, and his score was one of the things that was criticized, I believe, by, I believe by, uh, Roger Ebert at the time, and it, it's an amazing score, it's perfect for that film, it's perfect for a horror movie, um, and again, it exemplifies the paranoia. You don't know where the next thing is going to come from. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know who's a thing and who isn't. You have these scenes that kind of, in terms of like the shots in the movie, uh, there are a fair amount of shots or at least scenes that are kind of very drawn out. You know, you have the stuff like with the uh, when the dog is wand at the very beginning of the movie when the dog is wandering through the hallways in the Arctic Research Base, and you just see the dun. Dun, dun, well, I'm I'm kind of doing the Jaws theme uh, in my head. <clears throat> Excuse me, but um, when the dog is kind of wandering through, or when you're going through, when the camera is actually shifting through the hallways on its own, and you're kind of just going through the hallways, you don't know necessarily if you're on a perspective or if this is just you know an establishing shot. Uh, and that music is going; it's great. And then even at the beginning too, it feels very, very kind of almost. I don't want to say anticlimactic, but it feels very, very slow burn. And that's really what that movie is, is it's a very slow burn until it ramps up to 11. At, at an instant, it can ramp up to 11, but that music works. 
for that film. I love that music. I love the way it pairs with that film. And I think that it's, as far as I'm concerned, it is Marconi's masterpiece, um, is the score for that film. And that is one of the only scores that I actually would like to have on a soundtrack. Um, it, it is one of the few that I, I would say that I would buy in a heartbeat. I don't, I don't currently own it. I probably should own it, to be fair. Um, but the other thing is I also own the thing on Blu-ray, so I can just pop the movie and then listen to the theme while I'm watching the film and enjoy it that way, how it's really meant to be enjoyed. Um, and then the other thing is I'm sure you had Carpenter's input on that, too, because Carpenter is a, a composer by trade, uh, or a composer first, generally, because he, he worked in a lot of sound stuff because I believe his father was, uh, a not a not necessarily a music composer, but I believe he was a music teacher. Um, but Marconi himself had ch he changed a lot of things in terms of uh, he, he, I would put him on the level of John Williams in terms of the the way that he could operate and the level of work that he could put out. Because again, he has over five hundred composition credits according to IMDb. 500 and again uh, some of those are even television shows and stuff I'm pretty sure um, but that's so prolific the amount of music the, the catalog I mean it must be hundreds, thousands and thousands of hours of just music that he has composed over, over the course of his career um, and that's that's something that should that should be noted and in addition to that also the fact that Again, it's kind of unfortunate, even though he didn't win it until later in life, but when he scored The Hateful Eight, that was his first legitimate Oscar. He had gotten a uh, posthumous one, I believe, or not a posthumous Oscar, because he wasn't dead at the time, um, but a uh, an honorary one, you know, one of the ones they kind of give for like, oh, you know, you've been in so many movies and you've been such a big part of the industry here, here's an Oscar. It's kind of like an honorary one. Um, but then he actually won one for The Hateful Eight, which I think I think was was a good way to kind of trail off the end of his career even though you know we didn't necessarily know that at the time um i'm glad that he won one that they they deemed that he could win one on merit because i think that it was long overdue it was kind of like when dicaprio won for the revenant you know i don't like dicaprio's early work really i don't like titanic or, or a lot of the stuff that he did back then but the stuff that he was doing with uh you know the Revenant, Wolf of Wall Street, and stuff like that later in his career, uh, up, up to now, really, and stuff, even stuff for, for Tarantino films like, uh, you know, Django and uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I think that he's become a very good actor over time, and I think he was very deserving of that when he finally got it. Um, again, kind of like Marconi, because, but I think that Marconi and DiCaprio were both kind of overdue for that Oscar. Um, I think that they're, they're, they're similar in that sense. Um, but you know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna carry this on too too long because I mean the guy again, like I said, the guy had over 500 composition credits to his name. I could literally sit here for two hours and go on about this, um, but I'm not going to. I'm just gonna kind of highlight the things that I really enjoyed from his catalog. And uh, you know, a as usual, I want you guys to tell me, you know, what was your favorite, either your favorite film that he scored or your favorite or your favorite piece of uh, either composition or music that he created. Um, you know, you can put that down in the, in the uh, comments below as usual. Um, remember to uh, hit the bell for notifications, hit the like button, subscribe, and remember, I live my life free of compromise. Do you?